All right, we're continuing our series uh, called Twisted Scripture based on the book Twisted Scripture, and now uh, we're in chapter 2. And the lie being told by so many out there is that we get justified by works, that we're made right with God by what we do. And what is the Scripture that is twisted? Well, here you see it on the screen, James chapter 2, verse 24. In fact, this phrase appears three times in the book of James in the second chapter, justified by works. And it just makes you put the brakes on and go, whoa, what is up with that? You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. So this is a challenging passage which has been distorted over the years. And some of you may recall that Martin Luther decided that the book of James should not even be in the Bible because of this challenging chapter. He decided that the message didn't fit. It didn't jive with the rest of the New Testament. So it must be off base. Therefore, we should toss it from the Bible. Now, we don't believe that around here. We believe that God spoke through the Apostle James and that there is a perfectly legitimate meaning to his words. And so this morning, we're going to get at that understanding and ask God to really open up our uh, view of this passage and see the truth that sets us free. So let's jump into lie number two. You are justified by faith plus good works. Now, of course, the question would be, how do you know you've done enough? When have you gotten there? When is enough enough, God? And so we start wondering if I'm helping somebody across the street and if I'm giving money to charity and if I'm living a pretty good life, not getting drunk, not taking illegal drugs. I'm staying away from the super bad stuff and I'm doing some of the good stuff. Maybe I've arrived, maybe I'm okay, but you could never be sure until you hit those pearly gates and they do an assessment, a survey of how you did throughout your life. And so this theology really leads to a lot of people wondering and experiencing insecurity with God, not knowing where they stand. And so we're going to look at this lie, you're justified by faith plus good works. First, we see that the Apostle Paul tells us the polar opposite. The Apostle Paul tells us we are justified by faith, not by works of human effort. Here we see in Romans chapter 3, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So how clear could you be there? 613 ways to please God, but not one of them is actually going to make you right with God. The Jews were under the law and many of them, I mean this was a widespread misunderstanding. You toss a country, a couple of tablets of stone from heaven, God-given, and what do they assume? If I do these, then I'm made right. On top of those 10, you add in another 603 regulations about what to wear and what to eat. And people begin to think, well, if I eat all the right things, and if I wear all the right things, and if I avoid all the bad stuff then I'll be right with God up in heaven. And yet, the law was never given for humanity to be made right. It is a total and blatant misunderstanding of the giving of the law. In fact, we're going to discover today that God gave the law to bring a consciousness of a problem, an impurity problem a spiritual death problem, a distance from God problem, an unable to attain problem. And that's why the law was given. The law is much like a mirror, right? This morning, I'm assuming that each one of us, most likely, we looked into a mirror. And when you looked into that mirror, it showed you the problems with your complexion. It showed you the issues, the dirt on your face. But never once did you think about unscrewing that mirror from the wall, taking it down in order to scrub the surface of your face with that glass in order to clean yourself. So a mirror shows us the problem, but it doesn't offer a solution. 
And today we're going to see that's what the law did. It shows us a problem, but it doesn't give us the solution. Apart from the law, we're made right with God. Galatians chapter 3 puts it another way. It says, now, no, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Being under the law is not a try your best scenario. But it seems like we got a lot of people today, even after coming to Christ, even after trusting Jesus for salvation, they're thinking that they can pick and choose from the Old Testament law and make God happier. See, God is happy with their decision about believing in Jesus, but now that they're saved, maybe they can really impress Him. So it's Jesus plus Moses and Jesus plus law keeping and Jesus plus Sabbath and Jesus plus feasts and festivals and Jesus is going to help us keep the law, they say. And so it becomes an amalgamation of Jesus plus Moses. And here we see that idea dashed against the rocks. He says, the righteous will live by faith. And that living refers to coming alive and also living. Coming alive at salvation, but also living every day. As the Apostle Paul puts it in the book of Galatians, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. So the question is, what is supervising us? See, that's a daily living question. What is supervising you? When you wake up on Monday morning and you're nervous about sin, what is it that brings you comfort? Is it your rule keeping? Is it the boundaries you've put up? Or is it the indwelling Christ? When you wake up and get nervous about the sins that you have recently experienced and you're hoping to do better, you're hoping that today is different, you're hoping for transformation in your thinking and your actions, what do you look to? To more rule keeping or letting Jesus Christ rule in your life even more. The indwelling Christ has possessed us. We are a people of God's own possession. He made us purple. He cleaned house and He moved in, making us a royal priesthood so that we could trust Him and live by faith. This is not about getting saved only. It is about waking up every day and trusting Jesus in the moment. The righteous will live by faith. Romans 3 puts it this way. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament talked about it. Nobody understood it. The Old Testament talked about it. I'll call a people who are not my people, my people. I'll call a bunch of people who've never heard of Moses, my people. I'll call a bunch of people who never kept the Sabbath, my people. I'll call a bunch of people who never kept any of my ordinances, I'll call them my people because they're going to be made right apart from the law freely by my grace. And so this was prophesied about and predicted in the old and yet the Jews couldn't see it. They were blind to it. They had blinders on when they read it. And yet, that is our experience today. Most of us in this room could not quote more than 20 regulations from the Jewish law. 20 if you're lucky. Many of us would be fortunate to get through the Ten Commandments themselves. I'll give you 30 seconds to try in your own mind right now. But you go through the stealing and the lying and the adultery and after you get through the murder and all of, all of the ones that are kind of familiar, you barely get to 10 and then you've only got 603 left. Well, there's a reason for that. The reason that it's so challenging for you is that you, my friend, most likely you are a Gentile. You were never given the law to begin with. And so you were invited to the new covenant, not Jesus plus Moses, Jesus plus nothing. And the fact that you cannot recall those laws is just another indication of how foolish it is for Gentiles to run around today pushing a mix of law and grace when they can't even quote the regulations in the law. It is a joke. And so you say, well, then why did God give us the law? I mean, clearly, we're not justified by the law. No one is justified by the law. We can't keep the law. We can't even memorize the law. 
We don't even have an awareness of the law. We're not made right with God by the law. So why did God bother? Well, I've already given you that mirror analogy. The law is like a mirror. It's like getting a diagnosis. When someone gets a diagnosis, that is not a treatment. When someone gets a diagnosis, they're being told by a doctor who knows what they're talking about, here is the accurate diagnosis. This is what you've got. This is what you've contracted. This is your issue. Now, that is not treatment. You don't want to walk out of that office just having a diagnosis. You want to make sure you wait for that doctor to tell you what the treatment is. And then you're going to take that little piece of paper and go down to the pharmacy and drive up to that window and hand it to that person. And 15 or 30 or an hour or two hours later, you're going to come back and you're going to get that prescription. It's been filled and that's your treatment. Well, the law provides a diagnosis, but it does not provide a treatment. Jesus Christ is that treatment. What then is the purpose of the law? We see it here, Galatians 3. The law has become our tutor to lead us to the treatment, to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. I mean, after you've got the treatment and you've been healed, why would you go back and say, Doctor, could you give me that diagnosis one more time? I can't remember what was it you said I had six weeks ago. You wouldn't make an appointment to hear the diagnosis over and over and over. You've got the treatment. In fact, you've been treated. In fact, you've been healed. And the Bible says, by His stripes, we have been healed. Healed of our iniquities, healed of our sins, so that we are spiritually whole. And we don't need to go back to Moses and say, what's wrong with me, Mo? You know what? Mo would tell you nothing. What's wrong with me, Mo? He would say nothing. You're a slave of righteousness now. You're born again. You're born of the Spirit. You've been made complete, born from above. You're a child of the resurrection. You're holy and righteous and blameless. And I only wish that the people of Israel back in my day could experience what you have now. The book of Hebrews says we have something greater and the Old Testament believers, it says some of them were sawn in two. They hid in caves. They wore sheepskins and goatskins. And they ran from people who were trying to kill them. And they were dedicated and committed like you would not believe. And it says they did not receive what was promised. And we have something better today. And so... We're no longer under this tutor. We don't need the diagnosis over and over. We've been treated by Jesus Christ Himself. What is the problem with the law and why is it given? Well, it's intended to curse people. That's what's so pathetic, so sad about people that want to mix law and grace today. They want to mix a curse with grace. They want to mix a curse with Jesus. It's great that you've met Jesus. Now let me curse you with the law. It's great that you're saved. Now let me put you in bondage. It's great that you're free, free from condemnation, free from guilt, free from punishment. But now let me put you under the yoke of slavery all over again. A slavery that not even the most devout Jewish forefather could ever keep anyway. Let me just hang that around your neck. It would be like this. All of those wearing purple this morning to celebrate your purpleness, to celebrate the fact that you're a holy and righteous priesthood. What if I came in here and just decided that I wanted to hang some sort of heavy garment over top of you, some thick, gray, dark garment over top of what you've decided to wear this morning? You came in here deciding to celebrate that you're a royal priesthood and a holy nation, that you got made purple by the God of the universe, and then I systematically go down the rows and say, yeah, but you need this, yeah, but you need this, yeah, but you need this, as I hoist some sort of heavy gray garment, a robe of sorts, over you, cloaking what you wore this morning. First of all, that's rude. I have no business dressing you. <laughs> Second of all, it's ugly. It doesn't, it doesn't match. It doesn't look good. Third of all, you can barely walk with the weight of this heavy garment. That is what it's like for people 
to be coming to salvation, clothed with Jesus Christ. Then, lo and behold, they step in church and they find a message that kills. The Bible says the law kills and the Spirit gives life. We got to be careful as ministers, all of us as ministers of the gospel, to make sure we are ministering things that free people. The truth sets you free. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Guys, if we don't go out of here every week being encouraged in the truth that sets us free, if we don't go out of here recognizing that we have an easy and light connection with God, then it is not the truth. I am not saying that world is easy. It is not easy and light out there, but our connection with God is a free gift, and it is light and easy, and it sets us free every single time. Don't settle for two garments. My friend John Lynch was here and he spoke on the two coats. You remember the two coats? He took off the old coat and he put on the new coat. But one thing he didn't do, at the suggestion of someone who came up afterwards, they actually said to him, hey, I kept waiting. I kept waiting for you to try to put on the old coat over top of the new coat to show that it wasn't a good fit and that it didn't look right. You see, that's what happens when we get to know Jesus by grace through faith, and then we start adding in self-improvement and rule-keeping and measuring how we're doing. And in fact, that person who suggested that easily convinced Mr. Lynch, and he's going to include the two coats combined going forward in all of his talks. He said, hey, that gives me a full five minutes to add on now. <laughs> Whoa. Galatians chapter 3 says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by what? All things written in the book of the law to perform them. So, I don't know what you've heard about the law, but I grew up, I grew up in Virginia, which is below, okay, below the Mason-Dixon line. It is definitely considered the South, okay? So we're in that Bible belt there in Virginia. And then I went to college in South Carolina, went to graduate school in Georgia. I have done my time in the South, and it was definitely the Bible belt. Because what I was told was, it's great that you've got Jesus, now keep those Ten Commandments. And so I was told that you were supposed to lift out, go back to the Old Testament law, to the first five books, to the Torah, and just lift out the Ten Commandments, put them over here on a pedestal, and do your best to keep the Ten Commandments because, my goodness, friend, if you are keeping the Ten Commandments, you are a good Christian. Now, there's only one problem with that. Everybody I knew was working on Saturday. I mean, everybody I knew, they were trimming hedges, they were mowing lawns, they were doing yard work, they were catching up on chores, they were doing emails. So we, in fact, were doing the Nine Commandments. So you start saying, well, what's the logic in that? What do I, as an average human being on this planet, how do I have a right to pick and choose from the law when Galatians 3 says, cursed is everyone who does not abide by how much? All things written in the book of the law. And by the way, the book of the law does not mean the Ten Commandments. It means the whole thing. The Torah. The first five books and all regulations contained within. It's an all or nothing proposition. You better perform them or you're cursed. So do you see how laughable it is then that 2,000 years later, West of Israel, thousands of miles across the Atlantic. Here we are in the great state of Texas, mostly 90 some percent of us as Gentiles, Gentile American citizens, Gentiles, non-Jews, and we're trying to bring 10 things from Moses into our Jesus. And the Bible says you can't do it. You're not allowed to do it. It's an all or nothing proposition. It's not choose your own adventure. It's not pick your favorite parts. It's an all or nothing adventure. And so it's not very adventurous when you end up dead. The law kills. James chapter 2 says the same thing, guys. If you haven't seen this passage before, it is a doozy. Look at it. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. Do you see that? That I don't get to 
pick my favorite thing. It's not like the buffet line at the Chinese restaurant. I don't get to grab the mushu pork but avoid the egg rolls. No, you get everything available whether you like it or not, whether you're allergic or not, whether it makes you sick or not. You take the whole buffet of the law, 613 entrees, and you got to take them all. It's all or nothing. If you stumble in one point, you're guilty of all of it. You guys ever had to relate to a perfectionist and everybody with a spouse says, yeah. <laughs> because our definition of what perfectionism is, is likely the three things she wants me to do or the five things he wants me to do. And if I don't do those things, he is ticked off. And if she doesn't do those things, I am disappointed. And so... We live around perfectionism, perfectionistic attitudes, standards to, ar to rise to. If you're in the workplace, you get promoted when you do certain things. If you're in academia as a student, you get grades when you achieve certain things. I mean, this is the way planet Earth seems to operate. But I want you to imagine being under the same roof with a perfectionist who has 613 standards for you to meet. I mean, you talk about eggshells, man. That is some serious eggshells that you're walking on. And that's why we need to see that God has shown us the, the stringency of the law so that we will choose grace. He has shown us how difficult and impossible the law is so that we won't flirt with it. We're not made to flirt with law. Flirting with Moses is cheating on Jesus. We're married to Jesus, raised and seated next to God Himself in the resurrected Christ, one with the Lord, not so that we can go back to Moses, but so that we can trust Jesus alone. By the works of the law... No flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We couldn't say it any better, could we? Through the law comes what? The diagnosis, and that's it. The knowledge of the problem, the knowledge of sin. So, if we're justified by faith, how do we know if we have enough faith? I mean, you know, we could get neurotic about this. A lot of Christians would say, I wish I had more faith. I'm not sure I have enough faith. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I don't believe hard enough. Well, remember the comfort that the Son of God gives us. He tells us that faith, even the size of a mustard seed, is enough. And what we like to say around here is it's not the size of your faith. It's where you flick it, right? A little mustard seed-sized faith, you just flick that right into the death and resurrection of Christ, and that's what saves. It's not the size of what you flick. It's not the size of the seed. It's not the size of the faith. It's the object of the faith. And so we take that mustard seed dependency, and we say, I'm going to place my dependence right there in the Son of God. I believe He is who He says He is. I believe He did what He said He did. I believe that's enough. It is finished. So therefore, I'm a forgiven person with eternal life forever, and He will never, ever leave me. He's a promise keeper. He's a perfect promise keeper, and He says He'll never leave me. So what does Romans chapter 3 mean when it says we establish the law? Because if you're following so far, I mean, Paul said we're justified by faith, not by law. That we're made right as a free gift, not by what we do. But Romans 3 says we establish the law. I mean, check this out. It says, do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So what, what does Paul mean? Another translation says we uphold the law. And I like that a lot because uphold reminds me of hold up. If we uphold something, we hold it up. We hold it up and establish that it is what it is. So watch this now. This is very important in understanding this passage but it's also very important in understanding that we here are not law bashers and we are not law haters. Watch what we do as gracers. Watch what we do as new creations in Jesus Christ. We say 613 regulations. That is perfect. 
and impossible. Therefore, I need Jesus. Now, look what I just did. In turning my back on the law, I turned my back because I recognized it is perfect, it is flawless, it is blameless, it is holy, it is good, and I can't live up to it. I can't keep it. So as I turn away from law and say yes to Jesus, I have just established, I have just held up the law and established that it is perfect and impossible. No way I need God's grace. And so what Paul is saying is, are we nullifying the law? Are we killing the law? No. Do you know that the law does not die? We die to the law. The law still convicts the unbeliever. Every unbeliever out there still needs the doctor to give a diagnosis. The, the doctor doesn't die. The diagnosis is not made null and void. The diagnosis is still there for any unbeliever who looks and recognizes they fall short of the glory of God. The doctor still gives the diagnosis. You need life. You are dead. You're addicted to sin. You're a slave of sin. You can't attain to this. You can't even get close. You need a solution. And that diagnosis is available every day. Not a jot nor a tittle of the law will pass away until heaven and earth pass away. The law is available to every unbeliever as conviction. But when you believe, you die to the law. Who dies? Not the law. You die to the law, being cut off from the law, not communicating with the law, not looking to the law, not looking to the law for instruction or counsel or guidance. You are then married to the resurrected Christ. You are the bride of Christ looking to Him for instruction. So the law doesn't die, but I die to the law. And in looking at the perfect standard that Moses brought down from that mountain, I am establishing that the law is perfect and impossible. Therefore, no way I need Jesus. So, I said it before, but it bears repeating. It is only those who are looking to the grace of God that truly respect the law. Anybody else who remains looking at Moses, looking at the law, saying, I'll take this one and I'll take that one, but I don't need this one and I don't need that one. I'll take this one and I'll take that one. That is not respecting God's law. When you turn your back on the law and say, I need Jesus because that is a no way system, you are the only one who is truly respecting the law at that point. All right, well, we'll finish with this. The reason we gathered here this morning around this lie was the fact that James chapter 2 says justified by works three different times. Now, I have heard some slick talkers in my day. I have heard some people say, well, James says justified by works, but he just means uh, justified before people, you know. Uh, apparently, Rahab wanted to look really good for the uh, fellow citizens around her in the apartments next door. Uh, apparently, Abraham was real concerned with his friends and what they thought of him. So it's just justified uh, in front of other people. It's not really about justified in front of God. I'm not buying that because this passage says, can this kind of faith save a person? This is about getting justified before God and getting saved. So can you look at this passage and see why Martin Luther freaked out? I mean, look at this. Verse 21 was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son? Then verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then you see, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the spies, the messengers, and sent them out by another way? So three times in this passage, three times the phrase justified by works appears, and you got to think maybe Brother Paul, if he ever got a hold of this, he might have scratched his head for a full five minutes. Brother James, what are you saying? And then Martin Luther, more than a thousand years later, Martin Luther, I mean, here he is scratching his head, and his conclusion is, uh, let's get rid of it. Yeah, that's a good interpretation. Just throw it in the garbage. 
And so you have to ask, what is going on here? Now, again, clearly to me, this is not about getting right in front of your buddies. This is not about being justified in front of your friends and relatives. This is all about God. So uh, let me just propose this, that there's a simple understanding of this. James happens to mention that demons believe... Right? Demons believe, even demons believe some good stuff. Let me tell you what they believe. They believe that there's one God. We call that monotheism. So all the demons are monotheists, meaning they know the truth. Deep down, they know there's one God. They also know Jesus hung on a cross, so they believe the cross happened. They also know Jesus rose from the dead. So they also know Jesus is the Son of God. So therefore, they're all Christians, right? I mean, they know He's the Son of God. They know He died on a cross. They know He rose from the dead. So ta-da, they're saved. The demons are saved. Wait, what? No. They're not saved because they have a set of beliefs or a set of facts that they know, but there's something they haven't done. What is it that we've done that they haven't done? They know what we know. What is it that we've done that they haven't done? They haven't opened the door of their lives. Sound familiar? What did Rahab do? Rahab opened the door to the messengers. Demons haven't offered themselves to God to be made new, new creations. Sound familiar? What did Abraham do? Abraham offered his son Isaac. So what James is saying is, is that there is theology out there, even the demons believe some correct theology, but faith without decision is dead faith. The demons have dead faith because there's no decision attached to it. And what we see in James chapter 2 is that we are justified before God when we open the door of our lives like Rahab and when we offer ourselves to God, just like Abraham offered Isaac. So what is salvation? Is salvation saying, you know, when the Spirit of God stands at the door and knocks, do we just stand at the door and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh absolutely, you're God. You're God of all, creator of all things. Jesus died on a cross, absolutely. Jesus rose from the dead, no question about it. Is that what we do standing at that door? At some point, we make that decision. If we're in Christ today, it's because at some point, we made that decision to reach out and turn that doorknob and open the door like Rahab did. And that is a living faith, not a dead faith. We made a decision to say, I need new life, therefore my old life needs to die. Therefore, I need to be put on an altar of sorts, kind of like Abraham put Isaac on an altar. I need to be put on an altar called a cross, Galatians 2.20, I need to be crucified with Christ. I need to be born again. So I am turning the doorknob, opening and offering myself to God so that I am crucified, buried, and raised to newness of life. And that is living faith. The demons will never do it. They've never done it. That's what sets us apart. That's how we are born again. So what we have is a living faith, not a dead faith. Conclusion. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God. You want to know the works? They were saying, show me the works. Got to do the works. Want to be justified by works? He says, this is the work of God that you believe in Him who He has sent. Whoa. 1 John 5, These things I have written to you who do what? Who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He's talking about living faith and saving faith. He's talking about believing and opening the door, believing and offering yourself. That's what James says also. So what did we see today? Well, we looked at the second lie in our series. There is a lie out there that you're justified by first having faith in Jesus and then collecting enough good works. But I want to remind you, how many times did Abraham put Isaac on an altar? How many times? Once. How many times did Rahab open the door for the spies? Once. So this is not about a lifetime of works. It's not about collecting a bunch of good stuff. It is about faith plus decision. 
The truth, you're justified by opening the door and offering yourself to Jesus by faith. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. You're not a double talker. You're not giving us two messages. We don't have to wait until heaven to understand. We can know the truth right now. And Father, we thank you that you have done it all. There's nothing we bring to the table except yes. There's nothing we bring to the table except wow and thank you and yes as we open that door as we offer ourselves to you and you do the transforming, we thank you, Father, that salvation is free, that we could never earn it. We respect the law and we turn our back on it. We respect the law and we pivot toward Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the clarity of your word. In Jesus' name we pray.